The Murder of Lovejoy Wendell Phillips This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On November 7, 1837, Elijah P. Lovejoy, an anti-slavery editor, was shot by a mob at Alton, Illinois, while defending his printing press from destruction. Prominent citizens of Boston called a meeting on December 8 to condemn the act of the mob. The Attorney General of Massachusetts opposed the resolutions of condemnation, defended the mob, and declared that, quote, Lovejoy died as the fool dieth, end quote. Wendell Phillips said to a friend, quote, Such a speech made in Faneuil Hall must be answered in Faneuil Hall, end quote. He made his way to the platform and spoke in part as follows. Mr. Chairman, we have met for the freest discussion of these resolutions and the events which gave rise to them. I hope I shall be permitted to express my surprise at the sentiments of the last speaker. Surprise not only at such sentiments from such a man, but at the applause they have received within these walls. A comparison has been drawn between the events of the Revolution and the tragedy at Alton. We have heard it asserted here, in Faneuil Hall, that Great Britain had a right to tax the colonies. And we have heard the mob at Alton, the drunken murderers of Lovejoy, compared to those patriot fathers who threw the tea overboard. Fellow citizens, is this Faneuil Hall doctrine? The mob at Alton were met to wrest from a citizen his just rights, met to resist the laws. We have been told that our fathers did the same, and the glorious mantle of revolutionary precedent has been thrown over the mobs of our day. To make out their title to such defense, the gentleman says that the British Parliament had a right to tax these colonies. It is manifest that without this, his parallel falls to the ground, for Lovejoy had stationed himself within constitutional bulwarks. He was not only defending the freedom of the press, but he was under his own roof, in arms with the sanction of the civil authority. The men who assailed him went against and over the laws. The mob, as the gentleman terms it, mob forsooth, certainly we sons of the tea spillers are a marvelously patient generation. The, quote, orderly mob, which assembled in the Old South to destroy the tea, were met to resist not the laws, but illegal exactions. Shame on the American who calls the tea tax and the Stamp Act laws. Our fathers resisted not the king's prerogative, but the king's usurpation. To find any other account, you must read our revolutionary history upside down. Our state archives are loaded with arguments of John Adams to prove the taxes laid by the British Parliament unconstitutional beyond its power. It was not till this was made out that the men of New England rushed to arms. The arguments of the Council Chamber and the House of Representatives preceded and sanctioned the contest. 
to draw the argument of our ancestors into a precedent for mobs, for a right to resist laws we ourselves have enacted, is an insult to their memory. The difference between the excitements of those days and our own, which the gentleman in kindness to the latter has overlooked, is simply this. The men of our day went for the right as secured by the laws. They were the people rising to sustain the laws and constitution of the province. The rioters of our day go for their own wills, right or wrong. Sir, when I heard the gentlemen lay down principles which place the murderers of Alton side by side with Otis and Hancock, with Quincy and Adams, I thought those pictured lips would have broken into voice to rebuke the recreant American, the slanderer of the dead. The gentleman said that he should sink into insignificance if he dared to gainsay the principles of these resolutions. Sir, for the sentiments he has uttered on soil consecrated by the prayers of Puritans and the blood of patriots, the earth should have yawned and swallowed him up. The gentleman says Lovejoy was presumptuous and imprudent. He, quote, died as the fool dieth, end quote. And a reverend clergyman of the city tells us that no citizen has a right to publish opinions disagreeable to the community. If any mob follows such publication, on him rests the guilt. He must wait forsooth till the people come up to it and agree with him. This libel on liberty goes on to say that the want of right to speak as we think is an evil inseparable from republican institutions. If this be so, what are they worth? Welcome to the despotism of the sultan where one knows what he may publish and what he may not, rather than the tyranny of this many-headed monster, the mob, where we know not what we may do or say till some fellow citizen has tried it and paid for the lesson with his life. This clerical absurdity chooses as a check for the abuses of the press, not the law, but the dread of the mob. By so doing, it deprives not only the individual and the minority of their rights, but the majority also, since the expression of their opinion may sometimes provoke disturbance from the minority. A few men may make a mob as well as many. The majority have no right as Christian men to utter their sentiments if by any possibility it may lead to a mob. Shades of Hugh Peters and John Cotton, save us from such pulpits. Imprudent to defend the liberty of the press. Why? Because the defense was unsuccessful? Does success gild crime into patriotism, and the want of it change heroic self-devotion into imprudence? Was Hampton imprudent when he drew the sword and threw away the scabbard? Yet he, judged by that single hour, was unsuccessful. After a short exile, the race he hated sat again upon the throne. Imagine yourself present when the first news of Bunker Hill battle reached a New England town. The tale would have run thus, quote, The Patriots are routed, the Redcoats victorious, Warren lies dead upon the field, end quote. With what scorn would that Tory have been received 
who should have charged Warren with imprudence, who should have said that bred as a physician he was, quote, out of place in the battle, and, quote, died as the fool dieth. How would the intimation have been received that Warren and his associates should have waited for a better time? Presumptuous to assert the freedom of the press on American ground. Is the assertion of such freedom before the age? So much before the age as to leave one no right to make it because it displeases the community. Who invents this libel on his country? It is this very thing that entitles Lovejoy to greater praise. The disputed right which provoked the revolution, taxation without representation, is far beneath that for which he died. As much as thought is better than money, so much is the cause in which Lovejoy died nobler than a mere question of taxes. James Otis thundered in this hall when the king did but touch his pocket. Imagine if you can his indignant eloquence had England offered to put a gag upon his lips. Footnote 33 appears in the body of this audio recording at 5 minutes and 33 seconds. Quote, I thought those pictured lips. At this point, Phillips points to the portraits in the hall. End footnote. End of The Murder of Lovejoy by Wendell Phillips. Recording by Robert Scott, Mojo Move 411.com, M O J O M O V E 411.com, September the 9th, 2007.